Hello, in this video we're going to talk about neonatal infections, the unwell child. Signs and symptoms of an unwell or ill neonate include lethargy, stiff limbs, cyanosis, grunting, severe chest indrawing, capillary refill more than three seconds, and this is checked on the sternum, an increased respiratory rate, greater than 60, high temperature, or low temperature, again stiff limbs, and movement only when stimulated. The first neonatal infection or condition we will look at is sepsis caused by bacteria. And sepsis is essentially the body's response to a systemic infection. It is common and commonly overwhelming with high mortality. The signs may be minimal, but Usually the signs and symptoms are those that we discussed in the start of the video. Sepsis can be divided into early onset or late onset. Early neonatal sepsis means that this is occurring less than 48 hours after delivery. Late onset is the neonate is already older than 48 hours. Sepsis is often confused with bacteremia. Now, Bacteremia is defined as the presence of bacteria in the blood, where sepsis is the response to the bacteria, which includes vasodilation, causing hypotension, tachycardia to compensate and to maintain cardiac output. Sepsis is caused, usually secondary, to a bacterial infection somewhere in the body. So the primary infection occurs somewhere in the body, such as the lungs, you get pneumonia, skin, cellulitis, urinary tract infection from pyelonephritis, gastroenteritis or um, from the bones, osteomyelitis. All these primary infections can lead to dissemination of the ba that bacteria causing sepsis. In infants, sepsis can be subtle and any suspicion of sepsis should be investigated and treated typically with empirical antibiotics such as gentamicin and benzyl penicillin. One of the complications of sepsis is that the bacteria can go into the brain, causing bacterial meningitis. And this is the second condition we will look at, bacterial meningitis. Bacterial meningitis is when the bacteria causes inflammation to the meninges. There is also viral meningitis, but viral meningitis is often self-limiting. Bacterial meningitis is much more serious. So what is meningitis? The meninges are layers of protective sheaths that cover the brain. The brain is actually covered by many layers because the brain is so important and needs protection. So let us look at what actually surrounds the brain. From the outside, um, superficially, we have the scalp, which includes the skin, fat. Below the scalp, we have the bone, the skull itself. Then we have the meningeal layers, which includes the dura mater, the arachnoid membrane, the subarachnoid space, which contains the cerebrospinal fluid. And then we have the pia mater, before we actually have the brain tissue itself. In bacterial meningitis, the bacteria irritates the meninges, these layers, causing inflammation. So what are the causative agents? Well, let's look at the common causes in neonates and in infants. Common causes of bacterial meningitis in the newborns, in the neonates, are E. coli, group B streptococcus, and listeria monocytogens. Now, group B streptococcus and E. coli essentially can be obtained from the mother during the delivery when the baby is delivered through the vagina. In infants, there are usually different causative agents of bacterial meningitis, such as Neisseria meningitidis, Haemophilus influenza, and Streptococcus pneumoniae. And these are the main causative agents also for young adolescents as well as young adults. Now, the younger the patients, the more subtle the symptoms. If meningitis is suspected, blood cultures must be performed to identify the causative agent. 
as well possibly a lumbar puncture needs to be performed. The signs and symptoms of bacterial meningitis include poor feeding, seizures, lethargy, irritability, high-pitched cry, bulging of the fontanelles because of increased intracranial pressure, fever, apnea, and vomiting. Treatment includes antibiotic empirically, which mainly involve the beta-lactams plus a macrolide or aminoglycoside. Dexamethasone, which is a steroid, is usually administered before antibiotics because it is shown to have overall benefits. Vaccination is thus very important as a preventative measure, as vaccination against some of these causative agents have been shown to reduce the incidence of meningitis by those bacteria. The next infection you must know for an ill infant is uh, pertussis, which is a ubiquitous, highly contagious infection. It's caused by bacteria known as Botticella pertussis. Clinical feature, it's essentially known as the 100-day cough, and it's divided into three stages. So over this period of 100 days, it's divided into three stages. What happens is the bacteria, Botticella pertussis, it's a coccus bacillus, and essentially it infects the infant via air droplets. From here, the infant will develop signs and symptoms such as paroxysmal coughing, inspiratory whoop, and post-tusive vomiting. As mentioned, the clinical course is a classic 100-day cough. And the 100-day cough can be divided into three stages. Of course, there's an in incubation period, which is about one to two weeks before symptoms start coming up. So the first stage is the catarrhal stage, where the person who has the infection becomes highly contagious. Symptoms also are similar to upper, upper respiratory tract infections. And this goes for about two weeks. Between two to eight weeks, the next stage is proximal stage, where you get essentially a worsening cough. Eight weeks onwards is the convalescent stage, where the cough subsides, and essentially it just subsides with coughs here and there for weeks to months. Myocarditis is a condition resulting from inflammation, infection of the heart muscles. It presents with a broad clinical spectrum of signs and symptoms in children. MRI helps in the diagnosis of myocarditis. The signs and symptoms include fatigue, chest pain, as well as signs of heart failure because the heart is irritated and cannot pump or pump enough blood out of the heart. Again, myocarditis is inflammation of the myocardium, the muscle fibers of the heart. The cause of myocarditis is usually secondary to a recent infection in the past two weeks. The initial infection could have been a respiratory or a gastrointestinal infection which has disseminated and traveled to the heart to cause myocarditis. The common agents that cause myocarditis are viruses, specifically an enterovirus such as Coxsackie and adenovirus. There's also another heart infection that can occur in neonates endocarditis, which is infection inflammation of the endocardium and or heart valves, which typically involve thrombus formation known as vegetations. Now the cause of endocarditis and these vegetative growths are bacteria, specifically streptococcus species and staphylococcus species. Signs and symptoms are that of infection, such as fever, diaphoresis or sweating, fatigue, arthralgia, and or myalgia. Endocarditis, you essentially get inflamed heart valves, initially by the bacteria. The bacteria then grow in this environment, causing vegetations. This can impair heart function and can lead to valvular heart disease. The causative agents, again, are mainly bacteria, including Staphylococcus aureus, group A streptococcus, and Viridans streptococci. 
An echocardiogram and blood cultures are useful for diagnosis, and treatment involve antibiotic therapy empirically, followed by targeted therapy once causative agent is identified. The next infection is infant botulism. Infants develop botulism from ingestion of Clostridium botulum spores. The sequence of events usually goes as follows. The infant inhales or ingests Clostridium botulum. This results in the signs and symptoms which typically involve diminished muscle activity. This can be poor feeding, there's lethargy, constipation, Rest failure, ptosis, decreased eye movements, and just lethargy in general indicates dim diminished muscle activity. The signs and symptoms actually arise when the bacteria produces the botulism toxin in the gastrointestinal tract. And this causes neuromuscular junction dysfunction, which leads to the poor muscular control and muscular movement. So when a muscle normally contracts, the nerves that supply the muscle releases peptides called acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. The acetylcholine will then bind onto receptors on the muscle cells, causing the muscle to contract. In infant botulism, the nerve is unable to release acetylcholine because the botulinum toxin inhibits acetylcholine release from the nerve cells. Because there is no acetylcholine being released into the synaptic cleft, there is no acetylcholine that can bind onto receptors on the muscle fibers, causing no contraction of the muscle, and so we get weakening of the muscle. Most infants require intensive care and many need mechanical ventilation. Median age is about 4 months, and this infection is more common among breastfed infants. Acute gastroenteritis, it's a clinical syndrome often defined by increased stool frequency with or without vomiting. Acute gastroenteritis usually lasts one week up to two weeks, but it can be more than two weeks. If it's more than two weeks of diarrhea, it is classified as persistent or chronic. Complications of acute gastroenteritis include de dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. The signs and symptoms of acute gastroenteritis include headache, diarrhea, vomiting, and fever, myalgia, um, and of course there's abdominal cramps. The causes of acute gastroenteritis can be viral or bacterial. It is most often viral. The viral causes include rotavirus, norovirus, or adenovirus. Adenovirus, as we mentioned earlier in this video, can cause uh, myocarditis, a secondary to the gastroenteritis. Bacterial gastroenteritis, uh, the causes are, include Shigella, Salmonella, and E. coli. Bacterial causes are often more severe. The next and final infection uh, of the infant I want to talk about is overwhelming viral infection. As the name suggests, it's essentially an overwhelming response to a viral infection. It's most often caused by herpes simplex virus or enterovirus. Herpes simplex virus can cause life-threatening or central nervous system infection in the newborn. Enterovirus may cause myocarditis or hepatitis among neonates. Let's look at how these microbes cause an infection. Let's begin by looking at the herpes simplex virus. The signs and symptoms of a herpes simplex viral infection include lethargy, formation of skin vesicles, about 60% of cases. They're often afebrile and maybe have conjunctivitis. Risk factors for neonatal herpes simplex um, vir virus infection is having a mother with herpes simplex virus. Prenatally, or perinatally in 80% of cases or postnatally. These risk factors can essentially lead to a herpes simplex virus infection, which can either cause one or more of the following. It can cause localized skin infection, as in the skin vesicles. It can cause a mouth infection, plus minus CNS involvement, 
and or disseminate the disease, leading to the overwhelming viral infection. Finally, the enterovirus, which can also cause the overwhelming viral infection. Now, enterovirus infections can actually lead to a fulminant hepatitis or myocarditis, which is infection of the myocardium, the, the, the heart muscle cells. Now, if it causes myocarditis, it often has with it encephalitis or hepatitis. The signs and symptoms include hypotension, jaundice due to the hepatitis, profuse bleeding, and organ failure. Again, an overwhelming viral infection is essentially the response the body does to a viral infection, which can... So those were the two main causes of uh, overwhelming viral infection, which are herpes simplex virus or enterovirus. Thank you for watching.